Good morning and welcome to day 24 of Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. Transformed by Truth. People need more than bread for their life. They must feed on every word of God, Matthew 4.4. 4. God's gracious word can make you into what he wants you to be and give you everything you could possibly need, Acts 20.32. The truth transforms us. Spiritual growth is the process of replacing lies with truth. Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Sanctification requires revelation. The Spirit of God uses the word of God to make us like the Son of God. To become like Jesus, we must fill our lives with his word. The Bible says, Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has for us. God's word is unlike any other word. It is alive. Jesus said, The word that I have spoken to you are spirit and our life. When God speaks, things change. Everything around you, all the creation exists because God said it. He spoke it into existence. Without God's word, you would not even be alive. James points out, God decided to give us life through the word of truth so that we might be the most important of all the things he made. The Bible is far more than a doctrinal guidebook. Doctrinal guidebook. God's word generates life, creates faith, produces change, frightens the devil, causes miracles, heals hurts, builds character, transforms circumstances, imparts joy, overcomes adversity, defeats temptation, influences, infuses hope, releases power, cleanses our minds, brings things into being, and guarantees our future together. We cannot live without the Word of God. Never take it for granted. You should consider it as an essential part of your life, like food. Job said, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. God's word is the spiritual nourishment you must have to fulfill your purpose. The Bible is called our milk, bread, solid food, and sweet dessert. This four-course meal is the Spirit's menu for spiritual strength and growth. Peter advises us, Crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation. Abiding in God's word. There are more Bibles in print today than ever before, but a Bible on the shelf is worthless. Millions of believers are plagued with spiritual anorexia, starvation to death from spiritual malnutrition. To be a healthy disciple of Jesus, feeding on God's word must be your first priority. Jesus called it abiding. He said, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of men, of mine. In day-to-day -day living, abiding in God's word includes three activities. I must accept authority. The Bible must become the authoritative standard for your life, the compass I rely on for direction, the counsel I listen to for making wise decisions, and the benchmark I use for evaluating everything. The Bible must also have the first and last word in my life. Many of our troubles occur because we base our choices on unreliable authorities. Culture, everyone is doing it. Tradition, we've always done it. Reason, it seemed logical or emotional. It just felt right. All four of these are flawed by the fall. What we need is perfect standard that will never lead us in the wrong direction. Only God's word meets what we need. Solomon reminds us every word of God is flawless, and Paul explains everything in the spirit in this in the scriptures is God's word. All of it is useful for teaching and helping people and for correcting them and showing them how to live. In the early years of ministry, Billy Graham went through a time when he struggled with doubts about his accuracy and authority of the Bible. One moonlit night, he dropped to his knees in tears and told God that in spite of confusing passages, he didn't understand from the point of his word, 
from this point on, he would completely trust the Bible as the sole authority for his life and ministry. From that day forward, Billy's life was blessed with unusual power and effectiveness. The most important decision you can ever make today is to settle this issue of what will be the ultimate authority in your life. Deci decide that regardless of culture, tradition, reason, or emotion, you choose the Bible as your final authority. Determine to first ask, what does the Bible say? When making decisions, resolve that when God says to do something, you will trust God's word and do it whether or not it makes sense to you or if you feel like doing it. Adopt Paul's statement as your personal affirmation of faith. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. I must assimilate its truth. It's not enough just to believe the Bible. I must fill my mind with it so that the Holy Spirit can transform me to, with the truth. There are five ways to do this. You can receive it, read it, research it, remember it, and reflect on it. First, you receive God's word. You listen and accept it with open, receptive attitude. The parable of the sour illustrates how our receptiveness determines whether or not God's word takes root in our lives and bears fruit. Jesus identified three unreceptive attitudes, a closed mind, hard soil, a superficial mind, shallow soil, and a distracted mind, soil with weeds. And then he said, consider carefully how you listen. Anytime you feel you are not learning from the sermon or the Bible or a Bible teacher, you should check your attitude, especially for pride, because God can speak through even the most boring teacher when you are humble and receptive. James advises, in a humble, gentle, modest spirit, receive and welcome the wor word which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your souls. Second, for, the most, for most of 2000 year history of the church, only priests got to personally read the Bible, but now billions of us have access to it. In spite of this, many believers are more faithful to reading their daily newspaper than their Bibles. It's no wonder we don't grow. We can't watch television for we can we can't watch television for three hours, then read the Bible for three minutes and expect to grow. Many who claim to believe the Bible from cover to cover have never read it from cover to cover. But if you read the Bible just 15 minutes a day, you will read completely through it in one year. If you cut out 30 minutes of television a day and read your Bible instead, you will read through the entire Bible twice a year. Daily Bible reading will, read, will keep you in range of God's voice. This is why God instructed the kings of Israel to always keep a copy of his word nearby. He should keep it with him all the time and read from it every day of his life. But don't just keep it near you, read it regularly. A simple tool that is helpful for this is the daily Bible reading plan. It will prevent you from skipping around the Bible arbitrarily and overlooking sections. If you would like a copy of my personal Bible reading, see Appendix 2. Third, researching or studying. The Bible is another practical way to abide in the Word. The difference between reading and studying the Bible involves two additional activities, asking questions of the text and writing down your insights. You haven't really studied the Bible unless you've written your thoughts down on paper or computer. Space does not allow me to explain the different methods of God's study. Several helpful books on Bible study methods are available, including one I wrote over 20 years ago. The secret of a good Bible study is simply learning to ask the right questions. Different methods use different questions. You will discover far more if you pause and just ask simple questions as who, what, when, where, why, and how. The Bible says truly happy people are those who carefully study God's perfect law then makes, that makes people free and they continue to study it. They do not forget what they heard, but they obey what God's teaching says. Those who do this will be made happy. The fourth way to abide in God's word is by remembering it. Your capacity to, capacity to remember is a God-given gift. 
You may think you have a poor memory, but the truth is you have millions of ideas, truths, facts, and figures memorized. You remember what is important to you. If God's word is important, you will take the time to remember it. There are enormous benefits to memorizing Bible verses. It will help you resist temptation, make wise decisions, reduce stress, build confidence, offer good advice, and share your faith with others. Your memory is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it will become, and memorizing scripture will become easier. You might begin by selecting a few Bible verses out of this book and that have touched you and writing them down on a small card that you carry with you. Then review them aloud throughout your day. You can memorize scripture anywhere, while working or exercising or dreaming or driving or waiting or at bedtime. The three keys to memorizing scripture are review, review, and review. The Bible says, remember what Christ taught and let his words enrich our lives and make you wise. The fifth way to abide in God's word is to reflect on it, which the Bible calls meditation. For many, the idea of meditating conjures up images of putting your mind in neutral and letting it wander. This is the exact opposite of biblical meditation. Meditation is focused. It takes serious effort. You select a verse and reflect over and reflect on it over and over again in your mind. It's focused thinking. As I mentioned in chapter 11, if you know how to worry, you already know how to meditate. Worry is focused thinking on something negative. Meditation is the same thing, only focusing on God's word instead of your own problem. No other habit can do more to transform your life and make you more like Jesus than daily reflection on scripture. As we take the time to contemplate God's truth, seriously reflecting on the example of Christ, we are transformed into his likeness with every, with ever increasing glory. If you look up the times God speaks about meditation in the Bible, you will be amazed at the benefits he has promised to those who take the time to reflect on his word throughout the day. One of the reasons God called David a man after his own heart is that David loved to reflect on God's word. He said, how I love your teachings. I think about them all day long. Serious reflection on God's truth is a key to answer prayer and the secret to successful living. I must apply its principles. Receiving, reading, researching, remembering, and reflecting on the word are all useless if we fail to put them into practice. We must become doers of the word. This is the hardest step of all, but Satan fights it so intensely. He doesn't mind you going to the Bible studies as long as you don't do anything with what you've learned. We fool ourselves when we assume that just because we have heard or read or studied a truth that we have internalized it. Actually, you can be so busy going to the next chapter or the next class or the next seminar or Bible conference that you have no time to implement what you've learned. You forget it on the way to your next study. Without implementation, all of our Bible studies are worthless. Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Jesus also pointed out that God's blessing comes from obeying the truth, not just knowing it. He said, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Another reason we avoid personal application is that we can be diff or is that it can be difficult or even painful. The truth will set you free, but first it may make you miserable. God's word exposes our motives, points out our faults, rebukes our sins, and expects us to change. It's human nature to resist change, so applying God's word is hard work. This is why it's so important to discuss your principle, your personal applications with each with other people. I cannot overstate the value of being a part of a Bible study discussion group. We always learn from others who we would never learn from on our own. Other people will help you see insights you will miss and help you apply God's truth in practical ways. The best way to become a doer of the word is to always write out an action step as a result of your reading or studying or reflecting on God's word. 
Develop the habit of writing down exactly what you intend to do. This action step should be personal, involving you. Practical, something you can do. And, prob and, and provable, with a deadline to it. Every application will involve either your relationship to God, your relationship to others, or your personal character. Before reading the next chapter, spend some time thinking about this question. What has God already told you to do in his word that you haven't started doing yet? Then write down a few action statements that will help you act on what you already know. You might tell a friend who can hold you accountable. As D.L. Moody said, the Bible was given to increase our knowledge, was not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. Day 24, thinking about my purpose. Points to ponder. The truth transforms me. Verse to remember. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. John 8, 31, 32. Question to consider. What has God already told me in his word that I haven't started doing yet? And to hear the message, go to PurposeDriven.com slash day 24.